And I would like to start from the introduction and the general subject of epigenetics and my personal, personal, professional, personal interest in epigenetics, uh, how I got interested in epigenetics initially. And um, I need to tell you the, briefly the story that it is um, originates from my PhD studies, of course. Uh, my PhD studies were devoted to uh, research on regulation of uh, potassium channels, voltage uh, regulated, invert rectifier and potassium channels, whatever potassium channels we have studied, the, this model organism or model cell uh, that um, were subject of my research. But in any case, uh, whatever specifically I was dealing with in my lab work and in my uh, lab projects, of course, uh, I was open to uh, see the progress, dramatic progress in the field and what uh, the lab in which I worked, the lab of uh, Professor Bernard Atali was uh, studying other things beyond the voltage-gated potassium channels in glial cells um, that was subject of my research. So uh, very exciting uh, research was going on that time uh, uh, on uh, cardiac potassium channels. And, uh, they were studying different subunits, uh, trying to identify subunits of the channel, cardiac channel, uh, find uh, those, identify and characterize modulation of those uh, channels that are being mutated uh, and they were discovered to be mutated in uh, several uh, genetic disorders. And, uh, of course, there's a very interesting and uh, clinically significant uh, syndrome that uh, was studied in, in, in the lab where I, where I did my uh, doctoral work was a long QT syndrome. Long QT uh, refers to cardiogram. Yeah, so uh, those abnormalities in cardiogram observed in mutations uh, in potassium channel in certain uh, residues in certain subunit, uh, not going into details of uh, KVLQT potassium channel, uh, and that was a very very hot subject and it is still is still hot subject of of research, but uh, since I was more inclined to genetics studies and was interested in genetics genetics in neuroscience genetics in molecular cell biology. Um, of course, um, I got interested in uh, that particular area and uh, what I found that time, and it was uh, second half of 90s, that uh, that very channel, KVLQT channel, is an uh, imprinted gene. It is an uh, imprinted gene. Uh, it, it is imprinted. Uh, in most human fetal tissues, except for heart, and uh, in uh, uh, long QT syndrome, there could be uh, certain uh, differences in uh, molecular regulation because of imprinting, because uh, this uh, uh, gene uh, lies in the imprinted region of the genome. Uh, so, uh, I was uh, got more and more interested in that subject, uh, just like a side project, not the project for lab work, but uh, of a project of uh, my uh, um, interest as biologist. And um, of course, uh, uh, that channel, KVLQT, KCNA9, it is a maternally expressed gene encoding potassium channel and mutations involved in cardiac arrhythmia uh, and the translocations, maternal translocations are observed in genetic syndrome that is called Beckwith-Widman syndrome. Beckwith-Widman syndrome uh, was and still is subject of uh, uh, investigation by molecular geneticist uh, and uh, now it is uh, much better 
understood and characterized than uh, 20 years ago, let's say. So um, interesting uh, that um, I was uh, got interested in uh, imprinting and epigenetics in general and uh, functions of those uh, processes in development and also relevance to disease and of course uh, disease uh, we are talking about cancers first of all but uh, of course uh, because of those mutations in potassium channels it is very much uh, relevant for cardiac arrhythmias and uh, for heart disease yeah uh, so mechanisms of imprinting i got a talk lecture on that subject uh, being a student uh, in uh, neuro biology department in Weizmann Institute. I, I, I gave a lecture on that subject because it was very, very interesting for me. Um, and of course, uh, I was interested in mechanisms of imprinting. And those uh, include the differential patterns of DNA methylation on, uh, in, in, uh, during embryogenesis. Was, you know, during development, how it changes was very interesting for me in uh, maternal and paternal uh, copies of the genes. And uh, this is the basic for imprinting. Um, uh, how this is uh, passed to over cell uh, division uh, from uh, uh, germ uh, line and how it is uh, passed in stem cells. Uh, this is very interesting and still interesting and uh, hot subjects of research. Um, about the imprint and genome, it is important to realize that those imprint and genomes form clusters. So they are located closely to each other in certain regions of the genome. And uh, it was uh, before the sequencing uh, was uh, fully established of the whole genome. So now, of course, it is much, much, much better understood. But it was a, a, a region uh, under very, very uh, hot investigation uh, by several laboratories. And I visited a leading laboratory in United States studying genomic imprinting. Uh, visited a lab of uh, Professor Shirley Tillman in um, Department of uh, Molecular Biology in Princeton University um, because uh, she was and is a, a well-known, famous world expert in imprinting, in molecular mechanism of imprinting. And it was before she made her fantastic uh, career as science administrator and uh, uh, it was just before, before all those uh, size administration uh, changes in her, in her own career. And uh, I was just interested in research, nothing else. And uh, it was coming from potassium channels. Uh, it is uh, very obvious and clear where it comes from. I interested in this subject of research. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, then uh, there was uh, many, many different discoveries and contributions uh, on the mechanisms of uh, epigenetic, uh, uh, epigenetic mechanisms, uh, identifying subunits of chromatin, modifying complexes, characterizing uh, modifications of histones, histone proteins uh, on various residues and various by various modification, what we know now as classical histone code. So uh, there are contribution by uh, very well recognized. Um, and of course, uh, David Ellis uh, may, uh, made a uh, very significant contribution to this area. Um, I was uh, in contact recently with Andrew Feinberg, uh, who studied epigenetic mechanisms in cancer and regulation of uh, uh, cancer-related genes, uh, tumor suppressors, and oncogens by epigenetic mechanisms. And uh, he 
uh, kindly provided me with a recent review on epigenetic modulators, modifiers, and mediators in cancer etiology and progression. Uh, very, very interesting review in Nature Review Genetics uh, that uh, they published on that subject. So it is, and it was, and it is very uh, promising and serious subject of research. Uh, of course, because of the mechanisms of cancerogenesis that have been discovered to be uh, regulation of cancer stem cells, uh, and um, because of the drugs that uh, uh, were discovered over the past decade or so that are effective in cancers. And uh, in general, histone uh, modif modulating drugs are effective. And uh, first of all, we are talking about the histone deacetylases. Uh, so those drugs were shown to be effective, and that's, that's why uh, there is a great interest uh, in, in that area of research. Uh, considering HDAC, histone deacin deacetylases, they are classified human enzymes. Consist, uh, fam it is a family of enzymes, consists of 18 enzymes. 11 of those contain a divalent zinc cation in the catalytic site. And the remaining seven uh, are sirtuins. So sirtuins, that means that the NAD plus dependent deacetylases. Uh, HDACs uh, are classified into four classes. Class one, HDAC one, two, three, and eight. Class two, eight. HDC 4, 5, 7, and 9, class 2b, HDC 6 and 10, class 4, HDC 11, and class 3, sirtuins, uh, uh, NAD plus dependent histone deacetylases. Uh, HDACs deacetylate lysine residues in the n termini of uh, histones, and we are talking about H3 and H4 histones. Uh, the, those, uh, we can mention those modifications. There are several different modifications that are all very well characterized using antibodies uh, specific to modified residue within uh, uh, histones. Uh, uh, histone free uh, lysine 9 acetylation, histone free lysine 27 acetylation among best known and studied and uh, more important possibly because of their biological function. Dynamic regulation of acetylation deacetylation uh, is maintained by histone deacetylases and histone acetyl transferases, heads, and they counteract each other. There's a certain balance of acetylation deacetylation reaction uh, HDACs function uh, in the histone surrounding nucleosomes, cause compact chromatin conformation. Compact chromatin uh, is not accessible to RNA polymerase, activators of gene expression, transcription factors, enhancers, and that compaction of chromatin results in suppression of transcription of the target genes opposite to function of deacetylases, acetyltransferases recruited to activate complexes uh, acetylate histones, leading to open chromatin conformation and activation of transcription by RNA polymerases. Uh, now, mm, need to mention uh, important uh, area of investigation epigenetics of aging and uh, the role of epigenetics in uh, biology of aging. Uh, fantastic progress was uh, achieved over recent years. I don't want to mention specific laboratory, even the review articles were published already by leading journals on that subject of research. 
uh, don't want to mention some somebody specifically, but uh, obviously uh, area of very hot investigation and uh, uh, important discoveries. HDACs function on heterochromatin. They maintain inactive inert state. Uh, so, um, in terms of uh, role of acetylases, the acetylases in aging, of course, we first of all need to mention uh, classical, canonical gene and protein, CIR2. CIR2 is uh, not activated the acetylase, as we all now know, master regulator of longevity, studied in model organism in yeast. Uh, Deacetylase and termini of histone leads to uh, inactive heterochromatin state, gene silence. Loss of CER2 shortens replicative lifespan uh, in yeast, of course, and then uh, it was uh, studied in other model organisms. Overexpression and the small molecule activators of CER2 extend lifespan. So this is the canonical classical gene discovered many years ago and uh, this is where uh, history of discoveries on, in this field originates from from those studies so studies in model organism show that uh, caloric restriction and starvation are accompanied by increase in histone deacetylase activity so there is a kind of pathway. So uh, there is a stimulus and re response. Stimulus is caloric restriction or starvation, uh, lack of amino acids and uh, other nutrients. And uh, the output is increased activity of uh, certain specific histone deacetylases on specific genes. And that suggests that in response to nutritional stress, global deacetylation serves to protect cells and uh, influence aging. And of course, um, uh, researchers who study this, uh, we need uh, to mention uh, Lenny Garenta, uh, Cynthia Kenyon, uh, David Sinclair, and many other researchers uh, who made very, very significant contribution, don't dare here to mention those who made significant discoveries, uh, just not the idea of this talk. In East, starvation is mimicked uh, by rapamycin. Rapamycin is an inhibitor of TORC1 complex. Uh, and the, that treatment uh, with rapamycin uh, displaces RNA polymerase from rDNA loading, inhibits transcription in those sites. rDNA silencing is facilitated by increased binding of the HDAC complex, and that complex is RPD3, syn3 HDAC complex, RPD3. Uh, and the acetylation of histones, uh, histone uh, H4 on uh, certain lysine residues. So that complex RPD3, syn3, uh, HDAC complex, I happened to study, uh, to learn about that complex many years ago while I worked in Canada on a model fungus for which we had gene expression data and uh, genome sequencing data and experimental data on secretion and some cell biology data. So it was already obvious for me uh, in the beginning of 2000s that RPT3 uh, syn HDC complex, of course, the conserved uh, the complex, uh, at least uh, among fungi and yeast, that um, it, it plays very very important role and uh, repressive chromatin effects of rapamycin serve to lower transcription of and of protein synthesis apparatus 
and reduces growth. So obviously uh, it's uh, rapamycin uh, uh, suppresses growth and TOR pathway uh, is a growth pathway, right? Epigenetic transgenerational effect of histone deacetylases are under active investigation. Uh, of course, uh, epigenetic transgenerational uh, inheritance is also very hot subject of research. I never worked personally uh, yet in that area, but uh, I'm aware of studies and uh, there are fantastic, very, very attractive studies published over the past decade on that subject. Uh, there's a, there are laboratories, uh, experts in this field. Um, there is a laboratory in Tel Aviv University uh, studying uh, in the transgenerational inheritance and epigenetic mechanisms of uh, transgenerational inheritance uh, there is a laboratory in Switzerland, in Zurich, uh, of Professor Isabel Mansui. And there are um, other, other laboratories in the world studying those things. V very, very interesting molecular studies on the uh, impact of uh, early development and the passing of certain traits, uh, stress, eff effects, of transgenerational effects of the uh, earlier life stress. Uh, unfortunately, my own personal life experience happened to be relevant for that subject of research, even though I never subjected myself or my close relatives to molecular tests. But uh, uh, it happened that those who move from country to country um, experience those kinds of stresses that are very much relevant for that area of investigation for transgenerational effects of uh, uh, epigenetic in, in epigenetic inheritance so here i need to mention uh, just brails inactive x chromosome uh, has under acetylated histones well x another x chromosome is active with many uh, histones being acetylated. In males, status of uh, Y chromosome, histone acetylation needs to be uh, more detailed uh, studied. Or I, I need to learn myself more about what is already known. And again, uh, never try to uh, focus on, uh, on those things specifically, just realize how important it is. Interesting that HDC inhibitors cause increased histone acetylation and activation of genes in inactive X chromosome. So uh, what we uh, think about it, we think that possibly HDC inhibitors affect gene expression on uh, sex chromosomes. It is quite possible. Yeah. So need to be very careful about uh, uh, investigating uh, consequences of using those drugs for next generations. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and I, I didn't work in pharmaceutical, as I mentioned, so uh, not very much uh, uh, familiar with regulation process in the companies, uh, how rigorously they study transgenerational effects, but obviously effect on uh, inactivation, uh, histone uh, modification of sex chromosome is a very important thing. Now, beyond uh, modification of the histones, H3, H4 histones, the uh, histone code of modification, um, HDACs function outside the nucleus, so they modify uh, not only uh, they remove uh, acetyl groups not only from li lysine residues on the histone proteins, but also on non-histone substrate proteins outside of the nucleus. And uh, those enzymes, they are localized 
not only in the nucleus and uh, we need to consider specifically individual each protein each gene uh, each protein and uh, within hdac's families where they are located within the cell uh, because there are substrates uh, beyond nuclear substrates uh, histones and histone modifying protein complexes for example hdac6 deacetylates heat shock protein hsp90 uh, and also components of microtubal network and uh, the, of course uh, those components we need to mention alpha tubulin and beta tubulin so both alpha tubulin and beta tubulin have been studied in terms of modifications uh, activities of HDACs point to important functions of HDAC regulated microtubules, cytoskeleton remodeling in cell division, cell migration, chaperon signaling. So, since uh, these enzymes affect modification of microtubule and cytoskeletal proteins, there are consequences of uh, modulating those activities on cell division, cell migration, and other cytoskeleton and microtubule dependent functions within the cell. Trafficking of the proteins on, and micromolecules. So uh, uh, it is also relevant for stress responses. As I mentioned, HSP90 heat shock protein HSP90 uh, is deacetylated uh, so uh, for that reason it, it is very uh, important for heat shock responses as well histone acetylation uh, was shown to be regulated by cell cycle progression and that not only that, uh, depending on the phase of the cell cycle, there are differences in uh, histone um, acetylation, but also vice versa, reciprocal uh, influence, HDC inhibitors might affect tumor suppressor genes and cause cell cycle arrest. Uh, um, and that is their mechanism of action, and it's based on that. One of the, the possible mechanisms of action is that they cause cell cycle arrest. So we see that uh, it is a complex. On the one hand, uh, modifications change over cell cycle and being regulated over cell cycle in different phases. On the other hand, if we block this modification, it uh, may uh, cause cell cycle arrest. And obviously, the mechanism in, is, in, is linked to cell cycle progression. Non-enzymatic functions of HDIC are not uh, so well understood. Uh, mm, uh, of course, uh, uh, beyond histones, we need to consider that there are uh, multiprotein complexes and scaffolding, uh, large multiprotein complexes. And HDACs interact with numerous uh, other proteins. They interact with transcription factors and regulate activity of transcription factors. Uh, Non-enzymatic functions uh, need to be further investigated. So, of course, uh, mostly studies focused on uh, modifying uh, histones. So we need to consider all other uh, functions of HDACs as well to understand their biological actions. So there are molecules and this new generation of molecules that may downregulate protein levels, but they don't affect activity of the enzyme, enzymatic activity. So the uh, compounds uh, now under development uh, are not uh, trying to affect acti enzymatic activity of HDACs, but they, uh, their uh, purpose is to downregulate protein levels of those enzymes. 
Now, let's consider uh, histone-modifying multiprotein complexes. Typically, canonical histone-modifying complexes consist of several elements. It is targeting subunit that interacts with DNA binding proteins. It is a histone modifying enzyme, which is either a histone acetyl transferase or histone deacetylase. And third component is a factor subunit that acts on a chromatin. So HDAC is recruited and becomes component of a co-repressor complex responsible for repression of transcription. And uh, uh, there is a DNA binding subunit, co-repressor, and HDAC. So what are examples of such complexes? Let's uh, give a few examples of such complexes. HDAC co-repressor complexes uh, uh, include MIO-D, MADMAX heterodimer, SMRT, MECP2, that is very, very important uh, gene and protein because of the mutation in, in RET syndrome. Polycomb repressive complexes. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, for example, enhancer of SESTE, EZH2, containing repressor complexes. Uh, studied in Drosophila and now in many other organisms, uh, not only in Drosophila, but in other organisms as well. Histone binding protein, HDAC. So interesting example of regulation in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, regulation of GAL1, GAL10 system. Uh, yeah, this involves methylation of histones, uh, histone three on lysine 36. Uh, uh, it is demethylation and trimethylation of target genes. Uh, meaning GAL1 and GAL10. And this leads to recruitment of HDC and histone deacetylase, resulting in activation of expression of those genes. Because of the functions of those genes in embryonic and postnatal development, and because epigenetics plays such important role over development, uh, all of the attempts to manipulate those genes might have consequences for development of the organism. So need to consider those things carefully. It is important for drug development because uh, it could be teratogenic effects of HTC inhibitors because of the functions of HTC in development. Targeting certain HDACs might exclude use in pregnant women those who may be pregnant. So important to consider immunomodulation, metabolic, other functions of HDAC genes. So what we learn from knockout studies, it is important to realization that certain enzymes, for example, HDAC6 and the knockout of HDAC6, it is relevant for uh, neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, inflammation, cancer metastasis. Uh, and uh, while studying those effects, we need to consider not only uh, effect on gene expression, their histone modif modification, but also non-histone functions of HDC6 because of the possible effects on cell migration, uh, and in, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, uh, the effect that was observed by uh, the group in uh, Singapore, the group in Singapore studies uh, increased hyperacetylation of beta tubulin and effect on cell migration. And uh, there is an interesting study by Ixin Su uh, Laboratory in uh, Singapore on that subject of research. Now, uh, give, provide you with a comprehensive reference. I don't uh, 
list here specific articles, but I think it is very important for those who are being introduced to this research uh, to have glimpse on the fundamental textbooks and the reference books on epigenetics. And those include, first of all, uh, textbook called Epigenetics, edited by David Ellis and uh, published by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. And there were more than one edition of this, <coughs> especially chapters on writers and readers of histonacetylation, on erasers of histonacetylation, epigenetic determinants of cancer, histone modification in cancer. All these chapters are relevant, and I also mentioned uh, to you the review article kindly provided by Andrew Feinberg on epigenetic modulators, modifiers, and mediators in cancer etiology and progression, also very relevant reference on epigenetic regulation in cancer. <coughs> Uh, uh, relevant are Lewin's genes. Uh, well, I can mention um, genes 12 edition of many, many, many editions. Generations of students are familiar with Lewin's textbooks. Genes 12, for example, uh, published in 2018. Uh, Ageless Quest, Scientists Search for genes that prolong youth, uh, scientific adventure memoir investigation by Leonard Garante, published in 2002 by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. <clears throat> uh, very entertaining and useful book uh, written and published by Professor David Sinclair from Harvard about uh, his lab's work and uh, his colleagues' contribution, a uh, book uh, called Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. Have a copy of that book here at home and uh, enjoy the book beginning from the beginning to the end, a uh, book uh, published in 2019. Well, uh, it doesn't harm to read medical student textbook, such as classical, a textbook for medical students, Principles of Internal Medicine, that survived more than 20 editions by now. Mark, Reviews on Biology of Aging is The Genetic of Aging by Cynthia J. Kenyon, published in Nature. Um, yes, uh, this is a fantastic uh, introduction for those who uh, get introduced to the, to the subject. Shelley Berger and uh, her laboratory uh, contributed significantly and they published a review which considers epigenetic mechanisms in longevity and aging. And I'm talking about review published in 2016 by Shelley Berger, Epigenetic Mechanisms on Longevity and Aging. This is very important uh, publication on that subject. So uh, Daniel Alancar Rodriguez uh, works with uh, Ni Chongahil and they um, work on, uh, uh, on design and development of product mediated HDAC degradation. And this is probably next address for those who are interested in this topic. Uh, there is a key laboratory and Durbin laboratory in the United States in Dana Farber Institute. And, and the uh, colleagues of key, uh, Prof uh, Professor Key. And uh, Daniel Anka Rodriguez working with uh, Triona Conkail uh, on that very subject. So thank you for your attention. And have a wonderful day.